Greetings, happy Sabbath day. This is March 18th, 2017. Turn your Bibles to the 11th chapter of the book of Mark. I guess we're going to read the entire chapter. I hope you're using a King James or Geneva Bible. Webster's Bible's okay, too. Yeah, the dictionary guy, he made a Bible. He uh, updated the language in the King James to... Because the King James Bible was archaic language even in the days of Webster. So, you know, in 200 years, the language had changed, so he updated it. But the Bible never really caught on, but, you know, it uses the same manuscripts as the King James and Geneva do which is the majority or received text, as opposed to the modern Bibles that use the Vatican Catholic text, which doesn't even have the book of Revelation in it. So, you know, what can I tell you? All right, Mark, chapter 11. Let's take a look. Verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem... Nigh means near, unto Bethpage, Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is interesting because it's going to be the place where Christ returns. At the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his, of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, wherein never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door, without in a place where two, met, two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosening the colt? In other words, what do you, what do you guys think you're doing? And they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded them, and they let them go. You know, there's a part of the story that is just not recorded in the Bible. Um, I bet you an angel or something probably visited the owner of this cult and said, you know, uh, you know, my Jesus is going to be, you know, using this cult, let him have it or something, you know. We... It's just kind of conjecture on my part, but, you know, somebody must have said something to him. So, all right, and uh, let's see, verse 7. And they brought the cult of Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and straw them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Boy, that really angered the Jews hearing this kind of stuff. I probably read a... Uh, parallel verse to this. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. All right, so, and Jesus entered in, into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow... When they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, the symbol of Judah, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit 
of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, think about this. Jesus cursed a fig tree that it would never have fruit forever. Now, as far as my Bible research goes, Jesus never cursed anything in his ministry when he was walking on the earth. I mean, let's face it. He multiplied the bread and the fishes and fed thousands on at least two occasions. He healed the sick, healed people of palsies, cast out devils, brought the dead back to life. He never cursed anything or anybody. But he cursed this fig tree. Make some interesting points here. I mean, what benefit was this miracle? You know, the cursing of the tree. Did it benefit anybody? Did it bring anybody back to life or heal somebody that had been disabled or sick? No. I mean, he wasn't, you know, Jesus was always healing people. And yet this, he cursed the fig tree that would bear no fruit forever. You know, so th this is interesting. At least I find it interesting. You know, when the disciples were sent out by twos, some of the disciples came to a, a village and they wouldn't listen. The people of the village wouldn't listen to the disciples when they were telling them about Jesus. And this is recorded in the ninth chapter of Luke. And then the disciples said, well, should we call down fire from the sky and devour them just like Elijah the prophet did? Now I'm paraphrasing. And what did Jesus say? In Luke 9.55, he says, Ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. You know, Jesus was giving these people time to learn about the gospel, to repent. And besides, he hadn't been raised from the dead. His ministry wasn't over yet. Now, when he comes back, the door of salvation is going to be closed. Not just closed. It's going to be locked and nailed shut. Let's face it, people. The, uh, when Noah built the ark, everybody's like, oh, well, yeah, Noah preached, but he didn't gain any converts. Can anybody show me in the Bible where it says Noah preached the gospel to anybody? I, I don't see it. Noah just, God, God told Noah, build an ark. Take your family. I don't think he preached to anybody. I don't see it. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't see it. And then who closed the door of the ark? God did. God closed the door by his hand. Closed the door. And then the rain came and the, the water, the flood of waters from the, the fountains underneath. And everybody that was not in that ark drowned. Matter of fact, keep that in mind next time you, the, uh, Pre-tribbers tell you, oh yeah, it'll be like in the days of Noah. Uh, two were in the field. One was taken and one was left. And who was taken? The wicked. They were taken in the flood and drowned. Who was left? Noah. So when they tell you, oh, I want to be one of the ones taken in the pre-trib rapture, they're actually cursing themselves by wanting to be burned when Christ comes back the second time, you know, his second coming. He's going to, the, the world's not going to be destroyed in a flood. It's going to be, well, it'd be a flood of fire. It's not going to be a flood of water. 
pre-tribber is just, you know, if a preacher gets up in front of a church and tells them something, they believe it. They don't read. They read just enough to whatever the preacher tells them. So. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. Ooh. What would Jesus do? <laughs> he would kick them out of the temple. That's what he would do. And throw the tables over. Oh, boy. And began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, let me tell you something, people. These people had permission from the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees and Pharisees were Jews. Don't ever let anybody tell you the scribes and Pharisees are not Jews. They are. They had different beliefs they were just different denominations but they were jews and they had permission these money changers had permission from the temple priests to do this kind of stuff and they weren't catholic priests they were jews and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer or allow and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple and he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the Pharisees heard it. Oh yeah, the Jews heard it all right. And the scribes and the Pharisees heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Oh yeah, the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. He was upsetting their, their little business dealing. And you better believe these people that are that Jesus called the den of thieves, they were stealing from the people. And you better believe the Jews were getting kickbacks because nobody does anything for free. Nobody. Almost nobody. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So here it is. Jesus had cursed the fig tree. Now they're looking at the fig tree. And it's dried up from the fruit uh, roots. It's dead. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest, is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto him, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. Hmm. Forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, but if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Let's face it, people, the little paltry things that people do unto us and you can't forgive them for something little compared to what we did, the big things that we did against God. And if God could forgive us, surely we could forgive others. So, Jesus says forgiveness is very important. You know, there's going to be a lot of church people not in heaven because they don't forgive. All right, 27. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there came to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. 
the Jews and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And Jesus answered them, I'm sorry, and Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did ye not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority authority I do these things neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things you can't out you can't out trick God the Son nope ain't gonna happen all right let's go to the 13th chapter of Luke there were present at that well, verse 1 there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans. Now remember, Jesus was of Galilee. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. See, I, I guess evidently Pontius Pilate had killed some people that he didn't like and took their blood and mixed it with the 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 temple sacrifices. I, you know, I don't know why or how. I mean, I, I'm just telling, reading what I've read here. I don't understand it. Why Pilate would do that? I guess he, you know, basically it's defiled. So you know, Pilate is a uh, a Roman governor, and uh, the people that deny that the Jews were responsible for the murder of Jesus, well, they'll tell you, oh yeah, it was Pilate and the Romans. Well. Pilate tried to release Jesus three times. Matter of fact, I did a Bible study on the trial of Jesus. You know, Pilate wasn't no nice guy, but he but he had no reason to kill Jesus. And, you know, he tried to release him three times, but the Jews wouldn't have it. Nope. Nope, they wouldn't have it. So Pilate had defiled the sacrifices with the blood of of these people. So, verse 2, And Jesus answering said, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. In other words, no. I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And there's a new heresy going around telling people, well, you know, you don't have to repent of the things that you do. You just got to repent of your unbelief. Really? Jesus is talking about sinners and repenting. What is sin? Sin's transgression of the law, breaking the law. He's not saying, well, you know, except you repent of your unbelief, Ye shall all likewise perish. Even Satan believes in God, people. Read the first two chapters of James, especially James chapter 2. Satan believes in God. He's not saved, is he? His works are evil. The things he does, his fruit, he does things that are evil. Even his name is devil, D-E-V-I-L. Take a D in front of the word evil. E-V-I-L, put a D in front of it, and there's his name, devil. This, this heresy of repenting of just un, repent of your unbelief. When you come to believe, you better turn away from your sin. That's what God wants from us. 
I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 4. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. So evidently there was a, a tower in Siloam and it fell on eighteen people and killed them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Sinners. Not unbelievers. Sinners. Verse 5. Jesus says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus said, basically repeated what he just said in, you know, verse 5, what he said in verse 3. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish perish. Jesus is serious about sin. Think about it. What did he tell the woman that was caught in adultery? You know, and, and all the men were there and accusing her of adultery and, you know, well, we caught this woman in adultery. Should we stone her to death? And then Jesus wrote some stuff on the ground and then one by one they all took off and then he looked down at the woman after she was left alone with him and he says, Woman, where are thine accusers? She says, None, Lord. Or, I'm paraphrasing. He says, Neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. Oh, wait. Did he tell her, Go and repent of your unbelief? You know, no. He said, Go and sin no more. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. Now, who's a certain man? God, the Father, right? A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. So here it is, God came. He planted Judah, the fig tree, in his vineyard, the vineyard's the earth. And he came and sought fruit, fruit thereon and found zip, zippity doo Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. What did most people say? Most people say that Jesus' ministry was three years. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? You know, chop the tree down. Well, why is it taking up space? I could put something else where this worthless tree is, right? That's basically what it's saying. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone till this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. In other words, he's going to, you know, dig around about it. He's going to weed it and dung it. Dung it is human. Well, it's, it's animal waste. You know, it's fertilizer. Dung. It's old, old English word for uh, excrement. Manure, cow manure, for example. All right, so basically he's going to weed it and fertilize it. Verse 9. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Well, guess what? Guess what happened in 70 AD? The Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Destroyed it. Utterly destroyed it. Matthew 24, Jesus said that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another that wouldn't be cast down. And that was followed to the letter. God the Father had the Romans show the Jews what he thought of their little temple worship. 
So yes, God showed the Jews what he thought of their little temple worship by via the Romans in 70 AD, which is exactly what happened under the Babylonians many years earlier when they came and destroyed the temple and carried the Jews away captive to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about that in the book of Daniel. You can read about it in the book of Jeremiah. So, you know, God showed them, hey, this is what I think. Now, I covered this in a previous uh, thing of the fruit, but in Isaiah chapter 5, here is the interpretation or the background, the foundation of this parable. Isaiah 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Isn't that what Jesus said? That you know, My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, on, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done it in it? Whereof, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they, they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So here it is. The dresser is Christ. He spent three years on his mission, you know, basically trying to weed the garden and fertilizing it, giving people the message of the gospel, hoping that, you know, trying to make it so that the, the nation would bring forth fruit unto God. But then guess what? Then he curses the fig tree. And that's it. He cursed, Christ cursed the fig tree. And for 2,000 years, Judaism has been an unfruitful tree that's cursed. It's cursed, people. And the Jews have two groups today, the Temple Mount Faithful, and I think it's the Temple Mount Institute, that want to rebuild the temple and start doing animal blood sacrifices. And the Jews have a legend that when they build the temple, the Messiah will come. Well, guess what, people? In the time of the Romans, they built the temple and the Messiah came. His name was Jesus, according to my Bible. All right, turn your Bible to Matthew 21. Here, if you start in verse 1, you can uh, read the parallel account we just read in uh, the book of Mark about where Christ gets the, uh, the cult. And then he goes and uh, enters into uh, Jerusalem. Okay. Matter of fact, let's start... Well, you know what? Let's read the parallel account. Instead of me telling you all about it, it'd be easier to just go ahead and read it. Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they drew near nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage 
unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, and saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. I believe that's in Isaiah. I'd have to find that. But, uh, but it's there. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put, them, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the ways. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. See, Jesus was born in Nazareth. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. So you got children crying in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Oh, and those poor little Jews, they were unhappy. Oh, they're so unhappy. Now, what does Hosanna mean? It's used to express praise or joy or adoration. It's sort of like, uh, it's very similar to saying hallelujah or hooray or, you know, cheering people. But it also has reference to salvation, to be saved. Okay? I mean, it, it has a lot of different shades of meaning, you know? Uh, it also has reference to Savior. All right, so, you know, the Jews were, they were on, very unhappy. This is going on. So what does Jesus, what does he say, you know? Um, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. And they said unto him, who the Jews saying to Jesus, Here is that what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany and lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. All right. And now let's keep reading. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for we hold John as a prophet. 
And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? Listen carefully. This is the part where I wanted to read. Jesus speaking to the Jews. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. He repented of what? His unbelief? No, he repented of his actions. He says, you know, this, uh, a man had two sons. So he comes to the first one and says, oh, go to work in my vineyard. And the first one says, no, I don't want to. But later on he thought about it he turned, he repented, and, and he went and worked in the vineyard, right? So there was a time when he wasn't working in the vineyard. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he didn't go. I went and went not. So the first son says, no, I'm not going to work in the vineyard. But later he felt sorry, and he did. The second son said, oh, yeah, I'm going to go. But he never did. Whither of them twain did the will of the Father? They said unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them. Jesus is speaking to the Jews. Verily I say unto you that the publicans, the republicans, oh, I'm sorry, the publicans, the, uh, the publicans, tax collectors, that the publicans and the harlots, the prostitutes, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. That's some pretty harsh stuff. I'm telling you people, Jesus was so harsh with the Jews, which is why the Jews hate him. Go to the Jewish Encyclopedia and look up some articles on Jesus. Well, they won't have Jesus in the Jewish Encyclopedia. They call him Yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U. But it's pretty easy to figure out because they'll say he had a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph or a Roman soldier named Pantera, since Mary was a whore that uh, got paid to have sex with Pantera. And then you can read how Judas Iscariot uh, betrayed him and how he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. It's pretty easy to figure out who Yeshu is. So, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. In other words, they're going to respect my son. They may not respect my servants, but they're going to respect my son. But when the husbandmen... So think about God the Father sending his son. But last of all, he sent to them his son, saying, They will reverence my son, or respect him, right? Verse 38, but when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? If you don't want to know what a husbandman is, it's a you know, it's a, somebody that takes care of, the, uh, of a garden or a vineyard. 
So, when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? What are the Jews going to say? Verse 41. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Jesus is speaking to the Jews here. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And guess what? The New Testament was written in Greek. Paul's letters were, his epistles, his letters were to cities in Greece. Corinthians, Corinth. Thessalonians, Thessalonica. Uh, Galatians, Galatia. I mean, you know, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but whosoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees, the Jews, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And when they sought to lay sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Jesus said that all those that were born of women, there was not a greater than John the Baptist. Think about that. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, the Greek rendering of Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment, his clothing, of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. I don't think I'd be crazy about um, locusts for dinner. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, now remember, a Pharisee and a Sadducee are just two different denominations of Jews. They're both Jews. But the, uh, the Sadducees, um, maybe I should read that. All right, if you want to know the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees, the answer to that is in Acts 23 and verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. Neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. Now, the Sadducees only accepted the five books of Moses. The Torah. They were Torah keepers. Their Torah was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So, they didn't believe the rest of the uh, the Bible. They didn't believe in the book of Joshua or, or Judges or Kings or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel or Nehemiah or Obadiah. They didn't believe any of those books. They only believed in the books of Moses. So there's no resurrection and there's no angels to a Sadducee. And the Sadducees were the Pretty much, they were the temple, uh, the ones that ran the temple. They were the ones that did the sacrifices and what have you. So, 
For the Pharisees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Now, the Pharisees would accept pretty much the entire, what we call the Old Testament, but they had what they call the oral law. Yeah, to them, Moses was given things that he passed down by word of mouth. They weren't written down. Where is that in the Bible? It's not. There's no such thing as oral law in the Bible. But the Jews just, you know, they make up whatever they want to make up. And Jesus condemned it. He called it the tradition of the elders. That's what they called it. So. All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he, John, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, chosen people of God. No, that's not what he said. He said unto them, O oh, generation of vipers. He's calling a vipers a snake people. O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Let's face it, people, Jesus and John the Baptist condemning these denominations as Jews would not be welcome in, in John Hagee's building, you know, church, whatever. O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat, for repentance. Fruits means works, people. He's telling them to bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. In other words, repent and bring forth good fruit. The Sadducees and the Pharisees already believe in God. So how are they going to repent of their unbelief like these hypocritical liars and deceivers tell you that repentance means Repent of your unbelief. The Pharisees and the Sadducees believe in God. And yet John is telling them to bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. Verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Listen carefully. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. To hewn down a tree is to cut it down and cast into the fire. Now therefore also the axe is laid under the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. What fire? The fire of hell. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. When you... When you have a fire and you got a fan, you start fanning the fire, you know, giving it a lot of air, the fire will build up. Air, fire needs air, especially if there's a lot of smoke and the smoke lingers. It keeps the fire from breaking forth and becoming large. That's why you use a fan. You blow away the smoke to give it air, and then the fire will, it'll, you'll get a bigger fire that way quicker. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What's chaff? It's the part of the wheat you can't eat. It's just fluff. So it's the part that surrounds the, the wheat kernels. You can't, you can't eat it. It's no good. So either you're going to be wheat 
or are you going to be the fluff around the wheat that gets burned? You know, um, this was carried out, like I said, in 70 AD when the Romans came and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. And there's a there's a Bible scholar that says that, um, coincidentally, it was the exact same dent, date that Solomon's temple that had been built earlier was destroyed by the Babylonians. And if that is true, and I, I haven't verified it, so I'm not 100% sure, but if it's true that the same date that Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians is the same exact date that the Romans destroyed it, um, what's the chances of that being a coincidence? Or is it God's hand? You know, when you uh, read in Matthew 24, verses 32, 34, Jesus said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender, that means young, and putteth forth leaves, ye shall know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So, the United Nations created the Israeli state in 1947 and 1948. So it's new, fairly new, right? But is there any fruit coming out of the Israeli state? No. A lot of leaves. But think about it. How can they produce spiritual fruit when that nation as a whole rejects Christ. Think about it. Now, one of the things I find interesting is when you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you got the tree of life and you got the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is it symbolic? Is Christ symbolic of the tree of life, or is there actually a tree of life? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Is it an actual tree, or is it symbolic for Satan? Good questions. Not sure I have the answer, but we're going to cover that a little bit later. You know, in Luke 6, chapter 40, uh, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus said, for every tree is known by his fruit. You know, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. You know, every tree is known by the fruit. In James 3.12, it says, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? neither a vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. You're either going to get one or the other. You're not going to get both. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. I guess we're going to make I've got one more to do the conclusion. I've got to tie up all the loose ends. Sorry if I seem to cover the same material, but, you know, sometimes you need to hear something two or three th times before it, you know, sinks in. Uh, when I went to college, I always noticed when I heard the instructor, the professor, repeat something two or three times, I knew that was going to be on the test. I always wrote it down. You know, when Christ repeats something like repent, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When he says that twice, almost in the same breath, you know, it's important. Forgiveness, very important. 
And people will tell you all you got to do is believe, but they say, oh, well, you know, you don't, you don't have to do anything. Well, John said we had to produce good fruit. You know, there's more to more to life than just, you know, believing in God. And like I mentioned, you know, in the book of James, even Satan believed in God. The devils believe in God. They all believe in God. But their works are evil. We have to make sure that we have good fruit. It's important. So, all right, well, um, the next fruit will be the conclusion. And um, in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.